Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Harwich Company pop-up Q&A webinar for July 6, 2020. Hopefully, everybody can see my screen right now. We're out of the studio today. That's why I sound a little bit different than normal. So give me a quick chat back, a couple of people here and there. Tell me what you think uh, of the sound. Make sure it sounds good, you know, that you can hear me at least, and uh, that you can see the, the quick screen share. And we'll go over there. By the way, I also mentioned, um, yeah, I know it's not as good. I'm sorry. Not in the studio today. Um, so we'll be back in the studio next week. So um, good. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So a couple things to note, just to mention that, of course, this is a discussion that is a uh, educational in nature. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell any security. Past performance is no indication of future results. And of course, nothing we talk about today is really dedicated to a specific individual's question. So if you have questions and they are related to things about the stock market, economics, finance, or anything in between, well, I'll be happy to answer those. However, let's try to stay away from some of the questions involving individual names, individual stocks. But other than that, everything's up for grabs. So uh, ask away, and you can do so in the Q&A panel on the Zoom feature right there that you have. So let's do what we always do, and let's go through a little bit of a recap of what has happened since the last time that we were together. And of course, it's summertime, 4th of July, kind of a, kind of a weird year this year as I see it. Um, you know, the usual things that you would do are still available but you were blocked from doing a lot of things that you would want to do. I mean, I usually would either go to the beach or, you know, you could take the boat out or go to a party somewhere and kind of like two of the three were not available. So it really happened in our backyard and um, with just us, which was kind of interesting. But it is 4th of July and uh, we did have to see plenty of fireworks. Hopefully you saw the fireworks on TV. There was some cool stuff out there. Amazing local um, and, and all the different states that, that did that. Now, it's kind of interesting because over the last week, I have had a lot of questions come up from people. And, you know, the question has been, you know, how, how did we get here? And I said, well, it was kind of the same question and similar discussion from a lot of different people. You know, how did we get here? You know, we have record daily cases and hospitalizations, rising positivity rates, social unrest that, that we, we haven't seen in decades, um, economic hardship for millions of people. And we're not just talking about the whole idea of the pandemic, of how we got here from that and where the fault lies, but you know, rather it seems like a culmination of years of bad policy decisions that were made and a lack of I guess it would be a lack of forward um, or, or a, a reasonably, uh, well, a thought process and policies that were forward in nature, aside from just those things that were good for right now. So this is kind of the same thing that we see with companies, where companies are very much focused on the quarterly earnings report, right, where you have a situation that each and every three months of the year, infinitum, companies have to be responsible to shareholders to provide for quarterly returns. Now, what that does is it forces them to be responsible for the short term, but overly focused in on today. Similar to what happens with elections and election cycles, well, those are spaced out a little bit further apart. But one can only hope that with what we've seen with many of these companies that are pulling guidance while they are still required to provide quarterly earnings, that maybe there'll be a change to that. There's been some talk about that over many years, the whole idea of, you know, is it really necessary to provide quarterly information to shareholders because it really provides a, a very short-sighted view of what is going on with the company and companies are possibly desirous of making decisions that are good for the short term 
that may not be so for the long term because you know if, if, if a company comes in with with a loss because of a, a new investment that they made that they think is going to pay off years down the road but it has to show that on their quarterly returns the company gets punished so the same kind of thing happened i believe when it comes to our political our country and that's why we had so many of these things that have happened the the decision to cut the pandemic response unit the decisions that we've had for many many years about uh, college admissions and how that backfired and how cost of education went up and, and 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 all of the different things that you kind of can look at over time it seems like 2020 was the year that everything really came into play and we're going to see some outcomes of this that i think are going to be very substantial more so than we would have seen in the past and it looks like uh, that, that as a country, as a world, this may be the spark that helped to rectify some of the poor decisions that were made historically. And, and I think it's possible. I think that we'll see some movement to change the quarterly earnings. I think there'll be some changes that we are already seeing in terms of social responsibility and um, regarding you know the entire social backdrop of what's going on right now. So with that we have to acknowledge at the same time that we are about to be in quarterly earnings season and quarterly earnings season is starts off with the banks pretty much we have uh the banks that will be giving us their numbers starting in about two weeks jp morgan and we're going to see you know bank of america and citigroup and uh goldman sachs so they're going to come up first. And usually what we've seen in the past, and, and probably this time is going to be no different, is an easier reaction into earnings of the banks that, especially with, with, um, with banks being as battered as they have been, or at least left behind is a better way to describe it, over the last several quarters, due to the fact that we have low interest rates and a flattened yield curve and a very difficult time and a very difficult environment for banks to make money. And, you know, with you have all, when you have all these millions of people out of work and the potential for bad loans and mortgage deferments and people not saving and, and, and going through their savings, and again, and the Fed doing what they're doing to really curtail the interest rate environment, it's just not a good situation for banks. So I think there's a lot of um, concern going into the earnings. What we usually do see is banks magically come up with something, pull a rabbit out of the hat, and they'll have a decent earnings number. But uh, then kind of reality hits in a few days later. So I think we're going to see a very similar situation right now, probably some short covering ahead of the earnings into banks. And um, I, I think there's probably a lot of negativity that we've seen where earnings estimates have been brought down already so dramatically, but for the banks in particular, there's going to be a very low bar for them to vault over when earnings come to fruition and when they do the reports in the next couple of weeks. But right now, let me just talk about something I think is really going to weigh on the mind of people that are looking at the economy. Let's put aside the, the, the stock market, which the, the NASDAQ hit an all-time high again today. You know, we saw that the Shanghai and the Shenzhen and the, the Hong Kong markets had an incredible night, 45 to 5%, 6% ramp higher on a lot of rhetoric and and um, it was, I would say company sponsored, but it's government sponsored discussions in the government owned newspapers that said that it's a good time to start buying stocks. And we know of all the money that's being put into the, um, the, the, the various uh, levels of either markets or the economy by the, by the Chinese government. So uh, they are trying now to, to lift that as well. Their markets are up nicely for the year. Um, even with the markets doing as well as they are, we still have some, some, some economic issues to deal with. And I think the biggest one right now that we really need to focus in on and wonder what's going to happen and where there's maybe some concern is the income cliff. The income cliff. Uh, this, the idea, this idea is, is, is pretty plain in that we have about three and a half weeks until there is going to be a uh, the, the, the complete withdrawal of any additional income paid for by the federal government for unemployment compensation. The $600 per week that's currently being paid, 
That program ends officially uh, the last week of July. Now, all those people that have been relying, and we put, yeah, we put four and a half million people back to work last month, and that was only through the half of the month. So we have to realize that a lot of places have closed since then, and there's been a reversal of the phased in openings. And it only covered through about June 12th. So we, we got the massive part of that reopening play in that number that came out last week. So if there are going to be additional unemployed, because we did see another one and a half million go to the unemployment uh, route on uh, the initial claims last Thursday, which is a much closer time period for the, um, the numbers to come out. In other words, they're not lagged. Well, they're a week lag, not two or three weeks lag though. This, uh, this situation is very serious because uh, the spending that has really gone on has been supported dramatically by the $600 per week that is in addition to the monies that are paid by the states. Well, okay. So here we are with a situation where we're gonna have this expire on July 31st or the last week of July. And the big question right now is, is there going to be an extension of those benefits? So as we stand right now, there's some talk about uh, not wanting to, to, to actually implement those because if we implement those, the, the, the talk is, well, that's not encouraging for people to go back to work. If they're making more money or at least as much money for not working, there's no impetus, there's no real motivation for them to go back and work if they're being paid so well by the government. So there's a lot of talk in Washington right now about potentially adding some money back and extending those unemployment insurance availabilities. There's still about $165 billion left in the PPP program that's been unspent and that's been extended as well. So it is possible to see some relief, maybe another 30 days or so, um, possibly something like a $300 per week, and then maybe another 30 days at $150 to week, per week. I think that would be a reasonable thing for Congress and for the government to implement back. I do think that while I don't want anybody to suffer, that the government believes that th this is restraining people from going back to work. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that people are gonna go back to work, they'll go back to work. Some people will say, you know what, I'm gonna take this, this is better money. But at the same time, the question is, what jobs are they going back to? And what's gonna happen if people, you know, what happens if the mistake is made that people don't have the job to go back to, but yet they're not gonna be able to get that extra money? And, and that's a problem. It's a problem for the taxpayer paying it, it's a problem for the person that needs the unemployment, it's a problem for the, for the uh, companies that wanna hire people back, but they can't get the staff. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff going on. So there's gonna be this new stimulus discussion about, you know, we're talking about this infrastructure and this trillion dollars that the Democrats have put up that they want to go, the HEROES Act, they're calling it, money to the states, money to um, hospitals. So it's gonna be a kind of an interesting situation, but this, there was a massive consumption void that was filled from these benefits that were paid out over the last several, over the last several months. So I think with everything out there, with everything that's going on, I think this is the one that has to be the, the, the greatest focus uh, right now. And that's something. Now, I'm not suggesting, I want to be very clear about this. I'm not suggesting um, that there is a correlation at all necessarily to the stock market with regard to this. There's some it's more of an economic situation, which will then lead to what happens with the stock market. Right now, the stock market is, is, singing, to its own, is singing to its own tune. You know, we see stocks like, you know, Tesla, you know, all-time high today up another 10%. We're seeing, I mean, names that are like, you, uh huh? Like you, you say, what? Why is that company doing what that company is doing? You know, stocks up 30% in a day have no earnings and have never really done anything that, that just come down 25% the next. And then you have stocks and names like Amazon, great company, no question about that, all time high, over $3,000 per share today. But you have to wonder where are the valuations happening with all of this? So there's, there's, there's a lot of excess money that is, we've talked about this, snuck into the market, causing a valuation bubble in many of these names right now Question is, how long is it going to last? You know, you have to wonder if we were back at normal, would we be anywhere near this? 
Probably not, because right now we have a zero interest rate policy by the Fed. Nothing wrong with that. Make, uh, you know, make hay while the sun is shining here. But at the same time, I think we have to be very wary of some of these uh, potential levels, especially with the, with the, the volatility factors up as high as they are. So just something to think about. Anyway, so with that in mind, uh, do me a favor, load some of your questions. We have some questions already loaded. Um, the, um, in, in the Q and A's, so we will answer these questions. We, and by the way, I think I told you this before, I'm gonna tell you this again. We started this back in, I think it was probably in March. I think it was March, uh, it was one of the first ones. Uh, and I said, you know, we're going to do these, these pop-up webinars, these question and answer sessions, as long as there's interest. I, honestly, I didn't think there was going to be interest past, let's say, April. But here we are with another packed webinar all the way in July. So I think this is giving people, uh, hopefully it's giving you some insights, but also an opportunity and a, and a, and a venue to ask any question you want. And I'm gonna say it right now, as I always say it, there is no question that is too small, too insignificant. There is, there is, there is you know, there, there, yes. If you ask me what color shirt I'm wearing today, that may not be the most appropriate for this, but anything is game. Use this because it is here for you. So with that, uh, I'm gonna start answering some of these questions and do me a favor, we'll answer them as long as there are questions that are in the queue right now. We have a number of them. Uh, please ask away anything you want. All right, let's go with Carl. First question comes in. He says, the recent rapid market decline and recovery due to the presumption of a Fed put resembles the period of 1998 to 1999. Even the outperformance of the NASDAQ and the elevated VIX despite the market rally is similar. Do you think another blow off top similar to 1999 to 2000 is coming for the NASDAQ? That's the first question. Second, were the technical indicators that would have been enabled one, were, were there technical indicators that have, uh, would have enabled one to time the peak of blow off top in 2000? Let me start with the second one first, second question first. So back in 2000, there was a lot of things that were going on that you could have said, you know what? This is pretty insane. I, could, I always tell the story that I, was at, I would go to parties and, and, and people would pull me aside and start throwing names of these stocks out at me that even though I was following the markets very closely, of course, I'm like, what, what does that stock do? They're new. When did they come out? Oh, they came out yesterday. They're up 180% yet from their, from their IPO. Um, or I look at another stock and, and then somebody asked me about it. I said, yeah, but they don't have any prospect for making money. They're losing tons of money. There's really nothing going on. Very easy access. And that was one thing. But it was this culmination of everybody saying, well, valuations don't matter. When I start hearing that, it starts getting me very nervous. There is a much different NASDAQ today than there was back then. Back then, the NASDAQ was lit. Back then, I'll give you, the, I think, the best example. Back then, Amazon had no earnings, no prospects, looked like it was going to fail miserably. And that's not uh, something to even laugh about. That's, I mean, if you went back and looked at it, you would, have, you would have agreed with that. The difference now is Amazon is a quality company. It, it survived all of that. They, they survived the dot-com bust. And it is extremely profitable. Now, on the other hand, there are a lot of companies out there right now that are really moving up and moving higher with valuations that are very questionable. The big difference is there was a lot of air back then. The PE multiple was, I don't even know the number, it was incalculable for many companies. There were no earnings. It was price, but there was no earnings. I will tell you that when we have this irrational exuberance like we're seeing now, when people are talking about valuations not mattering, I think you are seeing some indicators that we're getting into that blow off. But here's the question for you, Carl, that you need to assess. And that is, there are so many people looking for, at the same time, there's a lot of people looking at the markets and looking that they want to stay in, they think it's going to go higher. There's just as many people that are saying, if the markets pull back, I want to invest, providing a floor. 
So going back to your first question, what, do I think there's another blow up top similar to 1999 to 2000 coming for the NASDAQ? Um, I think there is the very, um, I, I think a reality is going to play out over the next two quarters when it comes to many of these companies. However, there's also a lot of benefit that these companies have provided during these very unusual times that we're seeing now. So there's a much different backdrop, and I think I spent a little more time on this because I think there's some important issues here, that there is a much different backdrop. Valuations are a really big concern, and people looking at valuations two years out and trying to retrofit pricing into those numbers is, is a very scary game because we don't know what's going to happen over the next two years. And I'll tell you something else. It is my opinion as I've been thinking about this more and more lately, that we have to develop in the United States a total herd immunity or get a vaccine before this thing is done and through with us. There is no way from what I can see that we are going to be able to do the contact tracing like they do in China or in South Korea or anywhere else around the world. We are just not equipped to do it. Uh, our, our politicians are frankly dumb as bricks they just don't understand how to get things done. Everything's all about them. It's not all about, you know, they don't see past their noses. And it's a real shame. So we're going to have to go through a pretty substantial and a significant amount of infection rate on this whole thing. Get it through the system or get a vaccine. That's the only way we're going to do that. And it's the only way there's going to be a full and complete recovery potential for our economy. And especially that PVSD that I talk about, right? That post-virus stress disorder where the potential is that people are gonna be very scared and nervous about going out and, and, and seeking um, restaurants, bars, or a place, Disney, places uh, like cruise lines. I mean, it's gonna take a while. So, but I think that there is a significant amount of, of valuation distortion right now, Carl. Hopefully that answers that question. Wow, look at all these anonymous questions we have coming up. All right, here we go, Mr. Anonymous. How can the Fed actually implement yield curve control what is it? How can they do it? Why would they do it? And is this bad? So what they would do is they would try deliberately to actively go out and make sure that the yield curve itself, which is the differential in the yields of bonds, let's say from the short term at the one year or six month T, T bill, all the way through the 30 year bond. What they would want to do is have a normal slope where the shorter the bond has lower rates and the longer the bond has higher rates to such a degree, by the way, that banks can be profitable. That's what they're looking at. Don't forget, the Fed was built to protect the banks. That's what this is all about, right? They're there, yes, to help out the rest of the economy. But the fact is that the Fed is there to regulate or quote unquote, uh, quote unquote regulate, but really there to help the banks. So when you look at what's going on in terms of um, what, they, what their desire is and what they want to do, they would like to, and that's what they try to do at all times anyway, is control of the yield curve. The problem is that, you know, you have a lot of outside sources and a lot of outside money that would make it difficult. Now, could they theoretically say, you know, here's the rate on the two-year, here's the rate on the five-year, here's the rate on the 10-year, 15-year, or 20-year, I should say, and the 30-year. That's it. And if they do that, couldn't they control the yield curve that way? Possibly. I think they'd have a very hard time doing it because what would happen is you'd have the bond vigilantes come in and really try to upset that whole process and really throw the whole thing in disarray. And, and you'd have players out there trying to figure a way to mess with that and then get advanced because they know what it's going to be if they know what that is to peg. I don't know if they can actually do it. It hasn't been done successfully, although in Japan, they are doing some of that on certain levels. On certain bonds they have, they are pegging or at least uh, holding some of the rates at levels that they deem appropriate. Um, and, um, you know, th the answer is still out in terms of if that works or if, in fact, uh, there isn't, is any ability for them to uh, see any benefit of, like, let's say, negative interest rates. Next one comes from uh, another anonymous attendee. Why would companies now be motivated to manage to ma okay, why would companies now be motivated to manage responsibility if the government backstops of everything? What signs should we be looking for 
uh, an ad to know when all these government stimulus and back-end QE stuff is ending very badly. Well, I mean, some of this stuff doesn't have to end necessarily badly. Yes, I do agree that there is a moral risk that is rising very significantly due to the fact that, you know, you have people that get money that maybe shouldn't have gotten money. And the numbers are not like, oh, we gave this company, you know, $50,000 grant. No, we're not saying that they get $500,000 grant, $5 million grant. No, we have billions and billions of dollars going out to companies in terms of their bonds and utilizing those bonds then to bring money into the firms to either firm up their balance sheets or maybe even do share, rebal- rebu- uh, share buyback programs or possibly even dividend uh, enhancement programs. So there is a moral hazard with all of this. The Fed doesn't care. They think that they could do anything they want. It's not going to disrupt anything. But we're talking about trillions of dollars now in debt. We're in hock up to our eyeballs. And that naturally slows down the potential for growth of a company or the growth of a country. Our GDP is never going to return to a long-term rate above 3% for eons. It's impossible with all this debt that is dragging us. It is essentially a ball and chain that is tied to the economy, not allowing for us to really move forward with any speed, even if we want to, even if we tried. It's halfway impossible. This debt load that we have right now is very significant. So uh, they're going to have to continue just like Japan is continuing QA, QE in some way or another pretty much forever now because basically what we've done is we put the economy into a um, – we, we created a, 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 an artificial coma for the economy and utilizing machines to keep it alive so that the economy itself has to be regulated all the time forever right now. So I don't know, it may end very badly. And I think there is really not a happy ending to a lot of this because the the problem is that the patient now is so used to the heroin drip, the drugs to keep it, uh, it, it, it's heartbeat regular. And, it's, and, it, and all the things that are required to make sure that the economy beats on a regular basis is all being controlled by levers of fiscal and monetary policy. And, and that's just not a good way to run an economy. And unfortunately, again, as we talked about on top of this, it's all because of the bad decisions that were made, the short-sightedness of all of the different things that came up into where we are today. And that's the question where I kept asking myself of how did we get here? It's this culmination of all these issues that have really got us to this point that's irreversible at this point. Um, next question comes in and says, by the way, loved your recommendations on the Disciplined Investor podcast a few weeks back on having one foot in and one foot out recommending for retirement portfolios since no one can have time in the market and that you should never be out 100%. Well, thank you. I don't think that was a question, but thank you. Yeah, this whole idea we've been talking about for like a few months now, this idea of, you know, we don't know when exactly the market's going to move up or down, and that's okay. We could, Listen, we could try in some of our trading portfolios, which we do, to kind of get ahead of something, move you know, behind it, short a certain area, move into a position for a short-term swing trade, But in general, we still have a core holding in the disciplined investor managed growth strategy of equities. And those equity holdings, we go by a plan that says that we follow these specific rules for what will be the exposure to the equity positions. And pretty much, there's never a time when it's zero. I mean, it can be 20%, 25%. But that one foot in, one foot out, whether it means, by the way, to you, if you're thinking, well, what does that mean? Is that cash and that stock? What it means is that you have either a very much reduced exposure to overall risk in your portfolio. So if you're an aggressive portfolio uh, that, that is appropriate for you at this given time, it may be appropriate right now to be in a very conservative portfolio rather than being fully out of the market. That's just what we talk about. Um, next question. Um, 
You talk about a valuation bubble. What indicators would you be looking at to see the bubble is about to burst? There, the problem with this is you never know exactly when that bubble is going to burst. It's, it's impossible to, to understand when that's going to burst. And the reason for that is that, as, as, uh, as we all know, that markets can stay irrational longer than any of us can stay solvent if we're betting against it. So the truth of the matter is that the market is a being unto itself that can run either rationally, overshoot or undershoot. Now, we are definitely, in my opinion, overshooting at this point by a big degree, just like we overshot in March when basically we saw that stocks were just being thrown out like a baby with the bathwater. So when we are right now in the bubble, I don't think there's any way to tell when it's about to burst. You can watch the trend on charts and see when we're starting to roll over, number one. Number two, I've showed this before where we have some indicators like the key reversal indicator through the trade station trading app store, basically is a, psycho, a set of psychological and technical indicators that I built because I wanted to know when we were so overvalued to a point that, you know what, things got to get out of hand. And I talked about that a month ago, remember? When we hit that plus seven that we never hit before ever, historically ever. And I said, something is going bad. And we have an 1800 point day down, the 7% drop like four days later. Now, right now, we're a little bit overdone, probably a plus two right now. Uh, that doesn't mean that we aren't continuing on a very um, uh, difficult ride on that. But until the money dries up, the Fed isn't doing any more quantitative easing. Governments aren't stimulating. There isn't a constant flow of new money in. And remember, accounts, investor accounts, they're opening up more accounts than ever right now. You know what? There will be a time. And I think what you want to do, probably what you're asking me is, you know what? When the music stops, how do I know that I need to grab that seat? You know what? When you see the music is stopping, grab the seat. Don't wait to be a hero. Always be watching for where that exit is. All right, Carl has a question. He says, do you think that the Fed purchasing of corporate bonds and ETFs will result in a Japanif Japanification of the U.S. economy? Or will the differences with Japan, like a greater external ownership of debt, dollar being the reserve currency, lead to a different outcome? If so, what differences would you anticipate? So I think, Carl, one of the things are, yes, we are turning Japanese. There's a great song out many years ago that we're, you know, we're turning Japanese. I really think so. Uh, if you look at what led to Japan and the great, incredible amount of, you know, the Japan experiment where we all were envious back in the 80s to what happened, or 70s, and then what happened in the 80s and 90s, uh, when they were, you know, when all the years when they were buying up all that land around the United States, remember when they bought Pebble Beach, Rockefeller Center, and then the total meltdown. You know, one of the big things is was an aging society. The demographic shift that we saw with regard to the aging population in Japan was a major issue. And Harry Dent writes about this and talks about how you have. Uh, an economy, when you get the economy shifting where there are more people that are aged 55 to 65 and 70 than there are, let's say, the younger generation between 45 and 65 or 55, those people start to, the older gener generation start to take money out of an economy, don't put back in. And that aging population that we saw in Japan for many years is a big problem. Now, fortunately, depending on how you look at this, or unfortunately, we have the millennials that are starting to really make some inroads here. We see that there is the potential for millennials now finally at a point in time that they're moving out of their parents. I mean, the, the oldest millennials getting towards 40 already, aren't they? They're get, or yeah, I think late thirties. Um, they're getting at a point where they want to get the hell out of their parents' basements. They want to move on and they want to find a way to get their own house, their own apartment. And right now the whole move, the de-urbanization uh, uh, um, mode that, that people are in right now is really going to be supercharged with regard to millennials that are going to be looking for houses, whatever side they are, in non-metro centers so they don't have to be using mass transit and uh, living in, in apartment buildings and, and all, and, and they're going to have this 
uh, you know, the situation etched in their memory for a very long time about the lock-in, lockdowns, containments, confinements, and all that. So I think that we are taking the route, and it's, it's fascinating to me because Japan has never been able to really supercharge their economy. But nonetheless, we follow right along with what they do. I mean, the big thing that we really have to look for, and if you want your answer, is going to be if we go negative interest rates. If the Fed approaches that, which I can't imagine, but if they do, then yes, your answer is we're going to be all Japanifi Japanified, or well, the economy is at least. Um, somebody asked the uh, Andrew uh, mentioned T VIX and VIX in the past. What happened to the T VIX? And have you ever traded these in volatile times? Uh, T VIX has been taken off the market as of last week. I think it was last uh, last Thursday was the last day of trading. Uh, Credit Suisse had a series of these um, these funds that were very, very badly, well, they were barely, barely conceived. We all knew that from the beginning. Um, and they decided finally for the benefit of people, instead of just trying to make money and maybe trying to get out of some lawsuits, they're gonna just fold all these. They fold about nine or 10 different funds. Uh, my preference is that if you wanna go after the VIX for whatever reason, uh, just go right after the options market and uh, go after the VIX itself if you can. Couple more questions, just to let you know, we have about two, uh, two or three more questions here. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, make sure to put them in, or else this is going to be the last couple that we're going to have. I want to mention, uh, of course, the Discipline Investor podcast this week. We talked about a variety of things, answered some listener questions last week, and the week before we had some discussion about um, artwork, some investing in artwork. It's kind of cool. I was also the guest on a podcast this week. If you haven't listened. Frank Curzio's Wall Street Unplugged. Make sure to listen to that. And there was a video podcast that I was on that I thought was really pretty cool. We talked about commercial real estate and how commercial real estate in certain areas around the country is really very susceptible to a downturn and what to look for and what to be aware of. That is the Barron Report. You can go onto YouTube and look up the Barron Report. It was uh, last week, so just click on that. Uh, coming to you from the studio when it was operational last week. Had a little, little glitch t this week. Uh, but check that out over on there. Let me answer a few more here. Kurt asked, is Disney one of these stocks? No movies, parks closed, no cruises. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, I, one of what stocks? It's, it's a problem. It's a real problem. It, it, it's, you, you, forgot about the, you forgot about the big one in there, which is sports. I mean, no sports. What happened to ESPN they own? And the parks, partial openings, no openings. Um, I mean, you know, cruises are a smaller part of their overall. Um, Disney Plus has done very well recently. I think there was an 80% uptick in overall downloads, they said, for Hamilton this weekend. If you haven't seen that, that's there. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a big problem, Disney. It may come back. Uh, Raymond asked, your general thoughts on blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Can cryptocurrencies be considered a real store of value considering they're digital and not backed by any real asset? So, Ray, let me read that back to you. Can cryptocurrencies be considered a real store of value considering they are digital and not backed by any real asset? I don't think so. I, I, it's a trading game. I mean, all these crypto elites try to talk about how it will set you free and it, you know, it, it, it democratizes finance. It decentralizes the whole monetary system. And I don't think so. I'm not buying it. I mean, I think there is some trading opportunity and there's some interesting things, but from what we've seen of it so far, way too volatile. Although it's been, Bitcoin's been holding in the nine, let's see where it is right now, but in the 9,000 or plus range, let's take a look real quick where Bitcoin is. Bitcoin trading at 92.72. So it was uh, 10,000. In January, uh, it's 92.72. So maybe not that much different than the U.S. dollar right now, seeing about a 6% range throughout the year. But you know what? Uh, not my favorite place to put money. Uh, I just don't even see it as a diversifier. All right. Kurt, Kurt, excuse me. Kurt says, um, thanks, Andrew. These have been very helpful. I really appreciate you doing it. Thanks. Thanks, Kurt. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, somebody's asking me, 
so I'm not going to answer this. Thoughts on a few ETFs, specific ETFs? I am not going to answer that because that's more of a specific question, which we won't do. Um, last question, gold mining penny stocks have recently broken out. So do you think there's a new ascendance of the retail trade will make these stocks even more of the two? I mean, any, any of these uh, penny stocks across the board. Listen, if bankrupt stocks, Carl, right? If bankrupt stocks, there was a, a company that went bankrupt last week that as soon as the announcement came, the thing was up 20%. If bankrupt stocks are able to pull off 50, 60, 100, 200% returns in a very short period, I mean, why not penny stocks of gold miners or biotechs or I don't know, look at some of the names that are moving right now in the last few weeks, which is all the penny stocks that are involved in electric charging, like you know, there's companies like Blink Charging or Plug Power. Um, you know, these are companies that showed promise years ago, but still don't have anything going on. You know, when you start seeing a company like, uh, I, and I haven't seen this, Ocean Power Tech, which has buoys for creating uh, uh, um, energy, you know, you're going to see those companies go up 300% in a few days. I don't know when, but who knows? You know, it could. I'm not saying it will, but, you know, those are just the crap companies that people are putting money into, and it's really... Uh, unfortunately, a situation where uh, the, the, everybody's just throwing money into whatever it is, and some of the smaller companies, the penny stocks that have no liquidity, are just going to automatically start moving up. Once they start moving up, the Momo crowd starts to get their hand in it, and if it breaks above a key resistance point, well, that's it. You know, then the FOMO crowd gets involved and ramps it higher. But you'll see, like a day later, two days later, you know, the reality is maybe you know they don't do so well. I mean, gold is one of those things that if it does move up, it will take the entire industry with it. I think the, um, the better play is to play some of the big ones along with uh, where gold is going. And I think there's plenty of opportunity there. All right, we're going to end it for the day. I want to thank everybody for joining me as always. I'll be on DH Unplugged tomorrow night from the studio, uh, 9 o'clock with John C. Dvorak and myself. And we'll answer uh, all the questions that we are posing to all the news that's coming out to understand better what's happening. And otherwise, we'll be here again next week as well. So thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate everybody being here. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.